Good morning. It's nice to see a full audience. So welcome. We're very pleased to have you here for our prestigious master lecture series. This month, we're thrilled to have Dr. Zeig come back once again. He's also affiliated with our school now. He has been awarded the honor of distinguished professor. So we're really pleased to have his alliance. Welcome to those of you who are attending virtually uh, through live streaming internet. As you can see by the map, which I love the map, we are all over. We're in the US, of course. This represents how the size and number, the population, in terms of attendees. So Canada, so we have North America, South America, Switzerland, a little bit of Europe, a little bit of Africa, the islands, Australia, Asia, and quite of India, Pakistan, Qatar, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Singapore, and places that you're very familiar with, Dr. Zaig, when you do your worldwide workshops. Anyway, welcome. We have over 220 in virtually attending. So as you know, Cal Southern is part of our global community with participants in over 70 countries with approximately 2,100 enrollments. We're conveniently located here in Irvine, and our speakers become part of our global outreach for educational excellence. We invite distinguished guest lecturers to present on a variety of topics for the School of Behavior Sciences, where our MA students can sit for licensure as MFTs, and our doctoral students can sit for licensures as clinical psychologists. Our master lecture series provides training to our students in the most effective treatment modalities available today. Topics keep us abreast of current trends in the world that impact our quality of life. They present to our students, our faculty, alumni, and our worldwide audience, our community. Oh boy, what do we do? They are able to ask questions in real time while viewing the presenter as well as his PowerPoint and demonstrations. Our master lecture speakers become part of our global outreach for educational excellence. In terms of the reach of these archive video lectures, out of our 50 or so presentations, Dr. Zeig's lectures are the one most frequently visited. His talks on the perspectives on the masters, including Erickson, Satir, Viktor Frankl, et cetera, exploring the genius of Milton H. Erickson, Ericksonian psychology. He has many, many more and has had many, many hits, over thousands and thousands. Dr. Zeig is the director of the Milton H. Erickson Foundation. He's also the master architect of one of the largest psychotherapy conferences in the world, and that's the Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference, and we just had it this past December in Anaheim. It featured all the greats. Anyone, I was listening to the video that we made for Cal Southern, anybody who's anyone has to be at this conference, and they were. It was Yalom and Mnuchin and Yapko, Bendura, Claudia Black, all the greats, all the masters in the field alive today, including the Gottmans. They were all wonderful pioneers in the field, ready to share their different perspectives on their own unique version of psychotherapy. I'm pleased that the master of this particular forum, Dr. Zeig, is with us here today. Dr. Zeig, a little bit about Dr. Zeig. He's edited and authored more than 20 books. I see 21. I see he has a brand new book. Maybe he'll tell us about it. He's translated into more than 12 languages. He organizes the Brief Psychotherapy Conference that's coming up this December in Anaheim, the Couples Conference, the International Congress on Ericksonian Approaches to Hypnosis and Psychotherapy. He's on editorial boards of numerous journals. He's a fellow of the American Psychological Association, Division 29 on Clinical Hypnosis. He's a distinguished professor of the National Academy of Practice in Psychology, as well as at Cal Southern. And somewhere along the way, while touring the world, Dr. Zeig finds time to continue to be practicing as a marriage and family therapist in Phoenix, Arizona. 
We're honored to have Dr. Zeig here today to talk to us about the evolving innate brilliance of the therapist, where he'll explore Erickson's inventive techniques and patterns and provide insights into unique ways of tailoring, as a therapist, your approach to fit the client. In addition, he'll be demonstrating with live clients here in the audience. So without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Jeffrey Zai. <laughs> thank you, so much. Well, thank you very much. It's really a, a pleasure to be here with the people who are here in the audience and wonderful audience around the world. I think this is my fourth year of coming to California fifth year of coming to California Southern. So it's been uh, a pleasure every year and I uh, have, it's been a good learning experience for me and I'm very enthusiastic about what I'll be presenting today, which actually is an offshoot of a book that I'm just finishing and it's about the state of the therapist. And he, when you look at the PowerPoint, you see that I put the word state in quotation marks because, well, that's a really difficult term to try to define. It's an impossible term to define scientifically, but I think that it'll be important, and I, it's important to me, and by putting it in quotation marks, it allows me to bend, fold, staple, and well, mutilate a little bit so that I can use that term to represent some of the concepts that I really want to present to you. So I am the director of the Milton Erickson Foundation. If there's time, I'll tell you more about our activities, although uh, Dean Grimes has done a really great uh, job of orienting you to some of the things that we do and providing continuing education. But we also have a lot of things that are available on our website that you can take advantage of for free. And I uh, prefer to be Jeff rather than Dr. Zeig. So. Now, a question that we have is, what is psychotherapy essentially, and how can we begin to think about psychotherapy? Now, I started practicing psychotherapy in California in 1973. I got my uh, master's degree, and uh, the year after that, I earned my MFT here in California. So that's 40 years, although in 1969, I was working as a psychiatric technician with a hospitalized schizophrenic, uh, se severely disturbed patients. So um, psychotherapy has been a, a lifelong, really a lifelong preoccupation and, uh, a, uh, and a passion. So what is psychotherapy essentially? Uh -huh. Now, if for the therapist, what I, what state is the therapist in, in order to take a message that is convoluted and confused and disturbing to the client and try to create something out of that that is useful, functional, and generative? So we could think about what makes therapy effective and we could say, that the state that the clinician is can be a starting point for therapy. Now, I don't know anybody who said that clearly before, and I hope that that gives you some opportunity to think about what that could mean to you personally. What state you access, what states you access can determine how therapy will work. Now, most of the time when we're thinking about psychotherapy, we're thinking that we derive our methods from theories, we derive our methods from research, we derive our methods from techniques that we learn, books, from clinical supervision. But really, how, how can we be the best therapist? What will it take us to develop ourselves, our ways of being with our client? Now that requires us to be moving not from here, but from here. It, it requires us to be intervening more from here. It's as if we can transport ourselves, modify our state, depending on what's needed, and we can think that the technique, the intervention, the theory can be generated from the state that the therapist assumes. Now, having been blessed 
I live in a state of constant gratitude, being blessed by having many years of being able to interact with Milton Erickson, being able to interact with Carl Whitaker, Virginia Satir, Mnuchin, and uh, Carl Whitaker. Uh, I've seen therapists who are really excellent at their craft, and their excellence does not seem to come from the technique that they have. Their excellence seems to come more from their way of being with the client. So this has been my area of exploration and what I've been writing about uh, recently. Oops. So the goals for this presentation is that I want you to think about states. Now, as a person who does hypnosis, states are something that's really important to me because as you learn hypnosis, you learn that you can help somebody to alter their state. And the induction of hypnosis is a methodology for altering states. Having worked with hypnosis for more than 40 years, I think in terms of states. Hypnosis has not become a technique to me, it's become a lens, it's become a way of understanding. And once we can think about states, we can also think about an orientation that is essentially experiential, as if there are two poles in which we operate. We can operate within a psychoeducational pole, and we can inform people, give them information, give them strategies. And the other pole is that we can provide experiences, transformational experiences that help people to be different. In my own definition of psychotherapy, I would say psychotherapy is a symbolic drama of change. The implicit imperative of which is by living this experience, you'll be different. To me, my consultation room is a stage upon which I want to enact a drama of change, create a reference experience that is generative for the patient. So on these poles, I move into the experiential realm, and being experiential becomes a state that I enter into. I have been practicing being experiential for so many years, and it doesn't come by me uh, naturally. It, it's something that I have had to develop inside myself because I came from a, a much more mathematical, logical way of being. And then as I saw Milton Erickson, I saw somebody who was uniquely experiential, the most radically experiential of any psychotherapist. So the state's model, the state's model applies to patients because one of the thesis of my talk today is going to be that patients are in unadaptive states. And one of our goals is to help them to move into more flexible, generative states but not only for the patient, also for the therapist. And that will be the focus. And then if we think that therapist, as strange as I'm going to say this next sentence, therapist is a state. Therapist is a state that we move into and that is why I said I'll use, I'll, I'll use the term states very loosely. Therapist is a state. And then um, if we think of therapists as a state, then our job at developing therapists is going to take on a different form. It's not going to be through a left hemisphere way of educating people. It's going to move more to this polarity of what are the experiential things that people can do to be in the state of therapist. Okay, so thesis number one for our patients is that our patients come to us because they're inflexible. They need to develop flexibility in changing their state. Now, in order to do that, we'd have to think, what is an emotion, what is a mood, and what is a state? Now, if we're going to be therapists, we have to be experts in emotion. So if your client says to you, what's an emotion? How are you going to define that? How are you going to explain to a person what an emotion is? And I think we should have a definition of, an em of emotion. And not that emotion is clear. 
and not that we can necessarily have a completely clear definition of emotion because research experts whose job it is to study emotion may not agree on a definition, although astronomers can't even agree on a definition of what is a planet. And uh, for musicians, it's hard to agree on a definition of what is music. Those are, we, we understand it, but uh, we may not have a very clear definition. So I'm going to define an emotion as a adaptive, fleeting, visceral experience that is automatic, directional, and um, is a byproduct of the history of the organism. So just to simplify, an emotion is a fleeting, visceral, adaptive experience that's directional. We feel something viscerally and we either move toward or we move away. Now when you're defining emotion that way, it becomes clear that you can think, okay, well, fish, they could have an emotion because they move toward and they move away and there's some visceral experience that indicates to them move toward, move away. And then reptiles, well, they would have emotions too and birds, well, okay, we can say that they would have emotions and then lower mammals, they have emotions. We could say that human beings have feelings because we have a myriad ways of cognitively classifying our emotional response, but our emotional response is quick. It's over, we know move toward or move away, depending on our history. And our emotions are basically things that happen automatically. We don't have to think about them immediately. We feel some, we, ha we sense some visceral sense that indicates something directional towards us. And then they're adaptive because we can't survive in the world without them. We need uh, these emotions. Now, moods would be different because moods may not be adaptive, but moods would be chronic. And I don't know if there would be an animal model for a mood, but a mood would be a calcified emotion that wasn't necessarily adaptive. I'm in a hyper manic mood. I'm in a frustrated mood. I'm in a depressed mood. And our patients certainly come to us because they are trapped in moods and they don't know how to find their way out of these calcified moods. But states, well, they're a little bit different. And uh, states, well, these are a conglomeration. They're a conglomeration of relation patterns and memories and cognitions and attitudes and uh, symbolizations that we do, linguistic patterns, temporal patterns. So states are not so easy to define and yet we know when we move in and out of states. During the course of my presentation to you, you're going to move in and out of states. You will move in and out of states of being attentive and daydreaming and being thoughtful and remembering things and being curious and being focused, defocused. So you're going to move in and out of many states seamlessly, which, by the way, has an adaptive function. You want to be able to choose the state that you need to deal with whatever the demands are of the environment or your internal environment. Now, this is not a test, but this is just a, uh, a suggestion and something to help you in your conceptualization. So on the right-hand side of the PowerPoint, we would have states that are more adaptive and on the left hand side, oh, on the right hand side, are the opposite. The left hand side are the more adaptive states, the right hand side are the more unadaptive states. So, being industrious, well, that could be an adaptive state, and being lazy, that could be an unadaptive state. Being open minded could be an adaptive state, and being prejudiced could be an unadaptive state. Being responsible could be a adaptive state, being irresponsible, is an unadaptive state. Now, um, if the patient is coming to you and saying, I'm irresponsible, 
then this patient is locked into a state and doesn't seem to have the requisite flexibility to be able to move into a state of being responsible. And if you start to explain and move to psychoeducation and explain, well, this is how any intelligent human being would be responsible, curiously, it is not the royal road to changing states which is one of the reasons that I study hypnosis, because hypnosis is a way of helping people to change their state. And once you can get the model of understanding how to use hypnosis as a way of shifting states, then you have another way of perceiving, you have another lens that will help you to think about how do people change their state. So um, we couldn't say that being responsible is an emotion, we couldn't say that being kind is an emotion. We couldn't say that being alert is an emotion. So we have to have some way of categorizing these things. And I lump them into this amorphous term of states. Now probably experts would say that an emotion is a state and a mood is a state, but I'm reserving that term for a, a higher order of function and that um, these states are compilations of moods and emotions and attitudes and symbolization because we can't necessarily say that animals would have as much variety at being able to change states. Now this list goes on endlessly and I'm just using this to help prompt your thinking because, okay, here's other states. Being present is a state and being unavailable or absent, being inspirational is a state, and being uninspiring is a state, and pursuing is a state, and avoiding is a state, and uh, being altruistic is a state, and being empathic is a state, and being uncaring, well, that's a state too. So from studying hypnosis, I start to view my patients, and I start thinking, what state is this person in? How is this state adaptive? How does this state help this person to function according to the demands of the internal and external environment? It goes on and on. Being patient is a state, criticizing is a state, being moral is a state, being immoral is a state, being engaged is a state, being disengaged is a state. So it's a question that I can ask when I'm seeing a patient, what state is this patient locked into? Does this patient have the flexibility to be able to move freely into other states depending on the demands of the environment? We could say that faith is a state, doubt is a state. Okay, so I hope that that intrigues you a little bit to think what unadaptive state is the client in? How can I help the client to move into a more adaptive state? So a fundamental thesis is that our clients come to us because they want to change their state. Now sometimes they come to us because they want others to change their state. I want my spouse to be more responsible. I want my husband to stop procrastinating. I want my children to uh, be more industrious. So sometimes our patients come to us because they have demands on other people and they think that their state is fine and they just want others to change theirs. But then if we're thinking in that way, then we want therapists to have access to ver a variety of states. Now this could not happen with psychoanalysis. And that was an incredibly brilliant invention of Freud. Now we're going back in time and it's 1885 and Freud becomes interested in the psychological aspects of medicine. And this is news. And he um, establishes a, a movement that is very new in the world. Psychotherapy can be traced back by some historians to 1885 when Freud did become interested in the psychological aspects of medicine. Now there weren't many techniques then. So Freud went to Paris to study with Charcot and learn about hypnosis and turned out to be 
not a very good hypnotist and uh, not having a very broad understanding. I'm sure Coe's understanding of hypnosis was that hypnosis was a kind of hysterical phenomena and he was studying it as a neurologist. So Freud gave up on hypnosis, rejected hypnosis in favor of his psychoanalytic method and stated that hypnosis ruined the pure gold of psychoanalysis. And so hypnosis went into disrepute for 60 years until after World War II when the soldiers came back with what was then called war neurosis, which would now be called PTSD, and they needed techniques for helping people. And fortunately, hypnosis was kept alive mostly by lay hypnotists who then taught physicians, although Erickson was certainly not one of those people. He uh, stayed with hypnosis and really taught himself hypnosis and invented hypnosis. So um, when we're thinking about psychoanalysis, the patient comes in, this is the end of the Victorian era, and the patient comes in and the doctor, Freud, says, lie down on the couch, I'm going to sit behind you, I'm going to take notes, occasionally I will say, uh-huh, and uh, I may make some interpretive reflections, I might ask for some clarifications, perhaps in the course of things I'll make some confrontations, and you will explore the content of your unconscious, you will understand your transference, and you will be a better person by virtue of doing that. Now, in that case, the therapist had to be invariant. So you couldn't have a, a variety of therapist states because a variety of therapist states would ruin the transference and you wanted to create a situation in which transference would come to the fore. And Freud was brilliant, and he created a situation that would bring transference into play. So all of the residuals, the contaminating templates from the past that would blur, distort your vision of the present, would become clear in this situation because it was designed to create transference. The anxiety of lying on the couch, the anxiety of looking at the ceiling, the anxiety of free associating would bring forward the transference. The therapist had to be invariant. The therapist couldn't use the tools that were available. The therapist couldn't use gestures. The therapist couldn't use prosody, the musical nature of speech. The therapist had to be invariant to, for transference to happen. And now the first 60 years of psychotherapy were dominated by the psychoanalytic method. And after World War II, when Europe was decimated, then psychotherapy started to move to the United States. And now psychotherapy is a US export. We don't really import very much therapy. And uh, if you had a globe and a dart, and you threw the dart and you hit a landmass, it would probably be near where some American therapist is doing training. And, uh, you know, last year I did more than 150,000 travel miles traveling around the world because in the developing world, in the even developed world, people are still relying on learning a lot about therapy. Now, there's some wonderful therapy that happens in Australia, in Italy, in Germany, in the Netherlands, um, and uh, in France. And so there, there are growing expertise around the world, but still more often than not, psychotherapy is an American export. Now, taking on that American characteristic, we moved from the question of why, which was a predominant question for Freud, why are people the way that they are, to more of how. How can people be different? Now, how can people be different requires the therapist to be able to move into different states to help people to be different. You can't change your state, help somebody to change their state quickly by being invariant. You have to use what is available to you. And that is so strange to me as I reflect on my own training as a therapist, because my training as a therapist was my mouth 
to the patient's ears, the patient's mouth to my ears, and nobody ever explained to me that I could use prosody or gesture or proximity or expression or posture in order to help people to change their state. So um, that is uh, kind of strange. I suppose the best explanation that I have is that we're still somewhat under the um, the um, the 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 veil of psychoanalysis that uh, teaches us that in some way the therapist should be invariant, and uh, that's a you know pretty strange thing when you think about it. Like you know here's here's the therapist. Tell me, how do you feel about that? And uh, does it remind you of your mother? <laughs> and therapists sit in this therapist posture all day, and we wonder why therapists are subject to hemorrhoids. <laughs> but that's so, such a strange thing. And uh, my imperative is get out of the chair move around the room, use my body to communicate, create gestures and symbolic experiences, Shhh. moving into this experiential orientation. But to move into the experiential orientation, it's no longer cognitive to me. I don't think be experiential. It's a state that I enter into when the patient walks in the room and suddenly, Whatever the patient says, I'm trying to transmute that into a constructive experience that helps the patient to be more flexible in finding adaptive states. I, I uh, am trying to make that intelligible because I know that it may be a little bit different from the way that you have been trained and you've been thinking about psychotherapy but um, this is my area of exploration. So a, su uh, a suggested progression, now this is for changing states as well as for, for the patient, as well as for the therapist, that our ideas lead us to concepts, our concepts lead us to beliefs, our beliefs lead us into states, and our states lead us into identities. So an idea, being responsible is good. A concept, I can be responsible. A belief, I will be responsible. A state, I am being responsible. An identity, I'm a responsible person. So I'm not so much interested in helping people to get ideas because I believe that my patients are really intelligent and for the most part they don't need ideas. If they do, I'm glad to do psychoeducation and help them with ideas and strategies. But that what they need to do is to get the concept. And they need, the concept needs to be realized. There's the land of what we know and the land of what we realize. And those lands seem to be separated too much of the time. We know that we can be kind to other people. We know that we can do things that are healthy in terms of diet and exercise. We know that we can change our mood, we can change our state, we can change our emotion, because we've done it so many times. Do we realize what we know? What is the bridge between the land of knowing and the land of realizing? And to me, the, la the bridge is the experiences that we live. Suddenly, we get the concept. And we hope that we get the concept in some benign and intelligent way, and it doesn't take a serious illness or a serious accident to get us to bridge from what we know to what we realize. So creating experiential moments to me 
is that bridge and creating an experiential moment is grounded in the state that the therapist assumes and one of those states that I would assume is being experiential. So being experiential becomes a state rather than a con rather than an idea. Okay. And identities don't necessarily need to go through these four preceding steps. Something could happen very quickly and suddenly you're a different person, you have a different identity. And uh, that, that could be something good, a ceremony that happens like marriage and suddenly your identity changes and you're a married person. Um, or, but I, uh, identities don't n need uh, these precursor steps. Okay, so what needs to be known, what needs to be realized? So, impact should address subcortical regions of the brain. Now, I am going to cite my dear friend Dan Siegel, who has a wonderful representation of the brain, and he uses his fist and arm to represent the brain. And that this would be the spinal cord, the heel of the hand, that would be cerebellum, your reptilian brain, blinking, breathing, digestion. The thumbs should be two, would be your limbic system, your social, emotional brain, your mammalian brain. So fish are not very social, they don't have a developed limbic system, they're not social animals, but dogs are certainly social, and uh, have a wider range of emotional expression. And on top of that is our neocortex, and especially the medial frontal precortex, which is the brakes. So the limbic system, whew, that's like the accelerator, um, works on a few Fs. <laughs> Fight, flight, freeze, fold, and procreate. <laughs> uh -huh. So, but so to be social, I don't. Uh, so um, that when, if we are trying to reach people, trying to talk them into things, is okay, because we do have a prefrontal cortex that's capable of thinking and exerting some pressure on <coughs> our limbic accelerator. But if we really want to reach deeper into the human brain, we're going to do that by being experiential. Why is that? Well, because this is how animals communicate. We're animals. Animals communicate experientially. Fish don't have a problem communicating to other fish. They know when to move quickly and they know when to join into a school and they are communicating somehow experientially and birds certainly communicate experientially they don't have words that they're using to communicate but they communicate all of the things that they need to deal with their internal and external environmental demands and dogs certainly know how to communicate they communicate experientially and they uh, know how to hypnotize their owners into doing the things that the dog expects them to do. So animals, ex uh, ex <laughs> how did that implicitly get in there? Animals communicate experientially and implicitly and they influence each other's states. So we can do that because art is experiential communication. So movie makers, poets, novelists, and artists, well, they all communicate experientially. And uh, um, Steven Spielberg or Salvador Dali or Robert Frost, these people are experts at experiential communication. They use their medium to the extent that it's possible to create an experience. A poem does not exist in the land of psychoeducation. It exists in the land of creating an experience. And all the poet has is words and a piece of paper to create the experience of a tree. Robert Frost wrote a poem about trees and uh, creates the experience in you. you. He wants to create a realization inside you 
He doesn't want to give you information about the genus and species of trees and the morphology of trees and the classification of trees. He wants you to have the experience of tree. Now, the communication in a poem is unusual. It is not normal. What did you have for breakfast? And what are you going to have for lunch? And what are you going to do today? It doesn't live in the world of facts. It lives in a very unusual experiential world because we're trying to create a bridge between what you know and what you realize. And we don't go to movies because we want information. We go to movies because we want to have an experience. We might want to know what it's like to uh, be chased for a moment by a prehistoric creature. We don't actually want to have that happen to us, but we don't mind feeling it for two hours. And uh, because we want to exercise our emotions, we need art. Art is not an elective. Art is something that we must have in order to exercise our emotions. And art helps to bridge between the land of knowing and the land of realizing. So one of my projects is to study artists and to try to understand how artists think about the world and how artists create impact because it's experiential and then translate some of those ideas from how artists conceptualize experiential communication into the world of psychotherapy. So that leads me to uh, my next point is that therapists need an experiential orientation. So now I say to you convincingly that after 40 years of being a therapist, I have designed and redesigned myself to be ex increasingly experiential. So now I say to you, be experiential. And you say to me, uh, okay, now what do I do? Because it's not easy to think about being experiential. If I say to you, okay, now, tell me how to do systematic desensitization. If I say to you, because you're trained, now tell me how to do an EMDR protocol, or if you're trained in NLP, how do you do six-step reframing? You pop that out of your left hemisphere, you apply that template, and immediately you are following an algorithmic procedure, which, by the way, seems to be what insurance companies in the United States demand. Tell me the algorithm, because this has become more medicalized. Our field has become more medicalized. And in medicine, you have an algorithm that explains to you clearly what to do. You have a decision tree, and you have a standard of care that's, very, uh, that's much easier to follow, because you follow the decision tree and you know what the standard of care is. If the patient has a broken bone or uh, an infection, you follow the algorithm. So we have become inundated psychologically to think about techniques. What is the technique? Teach me a technique. Tell me, how do I work with anxiety? Give me the technique, I will apply it. And that makes me somewhat of a dinosaur because that represents a, an earlier phase of who I was when I had some interest in techniques. And now I'm much more interested in how can I help therapists if they have the concept, I'll be experiential, how can they develop the realization of being experiential when it comes to practice? So, we need a technology for helping patients and therapists change their state. Artists know how to change states. And a problem that I'm not necessarily clear about, but I'll go with it. That states are often altered by processes that are of necessity implicit to the recipient. You don't think about how Robert Frost constructed his poem. You don't think about how Steven Spielberg constructed his movie. You don't think about how Beethoven constructed the Fifth Symphony. And you really don't want to think about it. Because here's the world of experience, here's the world of information, here's the world of phenomenology. Phenomenology being lived experience. Here's the objective world, that's the world of science. So we need science to do some things, 
to get a rocket to the moon to understand uh, how a uh, what's the difference between a uh, dwarf star and a supernova. We need science to be able to understand things. But if we want, but in our world, it's not science that's necessarily going to help us to be better therapists. It's a much more subjective, phenomenological state, understanding somebody's lived experience, changing your lived experience. Once you make the state conscious, you move into the world of information. Just think about the magic trick. The magic trick is wonderful and you feel good because suddenly the lion disappears from the stage and it's fabulous. But if you then know how the magician does the trick, you don't have the effect. You don't feel it anymore. Now it's okay, you've categorized it, it's science, and it uh, um, is in the world of facts, in the world of information. So, um, if I explain to you, which I do in some of my classes, I, I show a two-minute clip of a movie, and I, I, I explain, because I've met with the director, how the movie maker thinks about putting together all of the elements in two minutes of film, which could be 50 cuts, that you wouldn't even see. You watch two minutes of a film, there's one cut every 7.8 seconds in a movie, and you leave the movie and you've never seen one cut because the director makes those implicit, although a good editor will time the cuts in a movie to the moments that he wants you to blink. That is an incredible uh, understanding of human attunement. If you make a rapid, discontinuous movement, you have to blink. A cut is a rapid, discontinuous movement. Uh, a, a really good editor will cut the movie at times when the editor wants you to blink to create physiological attunement. Okay, now that is a fact that's understood in the, edit in the editing community, but if you make that into a fact and you start watching a movie to look for the cuts and how the cuts are created to make the person blink, you will not have the effect of movie, which is to have some emotional, mood-changing, state-changing experience. But the process of changing states can be affected strategically, can be affected explicitly by the communicator. When I meet with composers and directors and uh, um, uh, visual artists of all, of all kinds, when I meet with these people, some percentage of them do understand strategically what they're doing in creating an interior design. And they understand every effect that they want to have and what mood they want to create by doing this design. But oftentimes, it is so intuitive to the artist that they can't deconstruct it into a scientific and factual realm. They just do it. But the person who is helping somebody to change states can know, although the person whose state is being changed probably shouldn't know and doesn't want to know, they just want to have the experience. You go to the movie, you want to have an experience, you don't want to analyze the science of movie making. So hypnosis, well, hypnosis is one form of experiential communication and to learn about hypnosis in the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century, you study Milton Erickson. And this is Erickson and me in 1975. I look the same, right? <laughs> uh huh. So Erickson was a very infirmed man. He was you know, confined to a wheelchair for the last 13 years of his life, constant chronic pain, and uh, just transcended his pain and perfused the atmosphere with a spirit of interest and joy and learning and helping. He was the quintessential wounded healer. And after I finish this book, my next project is writing Erickson's biography. I've been uh, 
given a grant um, by the uh, uh, by IAHB, a uh, California organization, to write Erickson's biography and try to explain some of the things that he did. And one of those things was he was 100% experiential. Uh, it's 100% exaggeration, but it's in the right direction. Um, Erickson was experiential with his family. He was experiential with the postman. He was experiential with his students. He was experiential with his patients. He turned things into an experience. So 1973, I visit Erickson for the first time. He's not even popular then. Uncommon Therapy just came out that year, which was one of the books that made him popular. And I started reading about hypnosis, studying about hypnosis. I started reading Erickson's papers, and I went, whoa, this is amazing. This is light years beyond anything that I had conceived as successful psychotherapy. And I wrote to Erickson. I asked, could I visit him? And he said yes. And in 1973, I drove to Phoenix from California, where I was living, and got to spend... Uh, three days with Erickson. And one of the things that he did, I don't remember if it was the first day or the second day, he draws three lines on a piece of paper. One of them is horizontal, one of, one of them is vertical, one of them is horizontal, and one of them is diagonal. And he says, what's this? I'm trying to be an intelligent student. You know, I take the page and I look at it and I look at it and I look at it and... I give up, and I say, I have no idea. And Erickson says, <laughs> and then he says, when you're working with patients, you don't necessarily believe what they tell you. You look for confirmation. Now, at that moment, if he would have said to me didactically, as a new therapist, one of the most important things that you could do is pay attention to minimal cues. I would have written down in my notes, pay attention to middle, min, minimal cues, and I wouldn't have had a story to tell 41 years later. But when he took that idea and he transformed it into an experience, suddenly I got it. And it became a concept that led me into a belief, that led me into a state that helped me to develop my identity as a therapist. So even very simple things in very simple ways can be turned into experiential moments. Um, and I think Erickson was a revolution in psychotherapy. So yes, you know, we have the psychoanalytic approaches and post-World War II we have exponents of behavioral therapy, and then we had the development of the humanistic approaches, and then the systemic approaches started in the late 1950s and seemed to peak into the 1970s and 1980s, and then the development of cognitive behavioral approaches, and I think Erickson represented a unique contribution in creating a therapy that was extraordinarily experiential that you could spend an hour with Milton Erickson as a patient and there would be nothing didactic. He would not be commenting on your behavior, your history, your relationship patterns. Everything would be giving you an experience. My history of being Erickson's student for more than six years was that he never taught me. He never explained to me, how do you do hypnosis? He didn't teach me, how do you use the confusion technique or the interspersal technique? For um, the times that I visited him, and then I moved to Phoenix in 1978 to be closer to him, all of that time was Erickson was like this. And he was just in the state of giving me experiences which could be hypnosis, or stories, or illusions, or metaphors, or fragments of poetry, or games, or directives that would help me to be the best Jeff Zeig, help me to be the best Jeff Zeig as a person and as a therapist. Now probably I should add into this slide the development of um, the affect of neurobiology of people like Dan Siegel, who 
represent what I think is a, a, a growing edge of how psychotherapy is developing as a major revolution in the 21st century. This is the uh, era of the brain. Okay, so now I am going to do something a little bad. That is that I'm going to move into the structure of explaining hypnosis and I'm explaining hypnosis and taking away the magic by making it into something that is intellectually intelligible but then it's more than the sum of its parts but I have a purpose in doing this so if we want to help people to change their phenomenology we need to do something about creating a map of how this the person operates and if we understand a map of hypnosis we can understand better a map of therapist so hypnosis is about phenomenology and therapy is about phenomenology phenomenology again being what is the person's lived experience and um, it's the opposite of science science exists here phenomenology exists here so if I was going to scientifically divide hypnosis into its component parts, well, you know, uh, a, a strand of DNA is something that is miraculous and amazing in the way that it's functioning. And if you divide it into a sequence of, uh, uh, you know, tyrosine, adenine, guanine, and whatever it else, else it is into the uh, genetic array, you don't get the beauty of what a strand of DNA is capable of doing, but you do understand some of the component parts. So hypnosis can be modifying attention. For some people, if they modify their attention, they say, I'm in a trance. Hypnosis can be a change in, in intensity, that things can become more or less vivid. Now it can be both. So somebody can change their attention and change the intensity of their experience. They can say, I'm hypnotized. Well, hypnosis can be a feeling of dissociation, like a sense of being here and not here, a sense of being, of things just happening. And um, hypnosis could be a social phenomena, a change in response. And this is how I help people to understand the fundamentals of what an induction of hypnosis is. But you need a fifth element, which is a contextual element. So hypnosis is a psychosocial contextual amalgamation. It's psychological in that it's a change in attention, intensity, and dissociation, all of which can be done psychologically, and that could be the basis of meditation, active imagination, autogenic training. But hypnosis is also a social response in which the person starts to respond to the meaning of the situation. Hypnosis is also a contextual response, which is that we need to define the situation as hypnosis in some way, directly or indirectly, in order for hypnosis to happen. So really, Hypnosis doesn't exist. Now that is a terrible thing to say to somebody who probably has the Guinness Book of Records for teaching hypnosis in more countries than anybody else in history. I think I've taught hypnosis in more than 40 countries. So, um, uh, but I, I'm, I'm exaggerating, I love hypnosis and I'm exaggerating to make a point. Hypnosis is a construct of convenience. It is a synergistic amalgamation that like DNA does something magical that's more of the sum of its parts. Now once we can start there, then we can look at depression from the model of states. Now I'm, I'm not negating the fact that there are wicked biological depressions that exist in people and that people need to have uh, medication or other physiological things, but I'm not a physician, so I don't do medication or extraordinary technologically sa uh, uh, developed things to help people with depression. So to me, I start to think about what is depression? How can I deconstruct depression into its phenomenological components? 
Okay. So I could say that depression is some combination of these elements. Now, you don't need to do all of these elements to say I'm depressed. But if you do five or seven or 18 of these elements, you are entitled to categorize your experience as depression. If you're a social victim, if you're internal, if you're thinking primarily in the past, if your vocabulary is if only, if only, if only, if you don't have, uh, if you allow your physiological energy to be deadened, you can say, I'm depressed. Now, what is cheerful about this? What is cheerful about this is that if you think systemically, depression is a system. If you think biologically, depression is a brain disease. Okay, well, you're welcome to pick up whatever tool you find on the floor of the philosophical universe and use that for examining whatever situation you encounter. So uh, my tool is to think about phenomenology and social construction. And to me, depression is a social construction because I'm going to make a social intervention. Then the imperative, the resulting heuristic is don't treat depression. No. If you're a physician, treat depression because you have a nostrum for treating depression, which is some chemical. But if you're doing a social intervention, don't treat depression. Don't treat the category, treat the components. So if you change one or two or six of these components, the category changes. And the way to train, change those components is experientially. Create experiences that help people to realize they can be active, they can uh, expand their vision, they can engage socially. And if they change enough components, they will change the category. You don't have to do that. So in my exaggerated way of thinking about the states model, depression doesn't exist. Depression is just a construct of convenience. It's a, it's a, a term that's used to describe a synergistic amal amal amalgamation of phenomenological, physiological elements. Now, if we can get that far in my very rapid march forward, <laughs> then uh, think about happiness. Well, if depression is here and happiness is here and you reverse the phenomenology of depression, you get happiness. So happiness is like the opposite of depression. And if you do the things on the right, you say, I'm happy. If you do five or ten or eight of those things, you say, I'm happy. And if you do five or ten of things on the left side of the column, you say, I'm depressed. So then happiness is just a construct of convenience. And happiness really doesn't exist. It's just a construct of convenience. And uh, so because depression is a system and happiness is a system, the question is what are the minimal number of components that can be altered that will change the construct that a person uses to describe their experience. You don't have to change all of these things. You could change one of them and that might be systemically significant. Okay, now, this is a long way to get there, but finally we get to the point, which is that think about the phenomenology of therapist. Now, if you do things on the left side, and if you do one or two or six of those things, you could say, I'm a traditional therapist. If you do one or two or six things on the right side of the PowerPoint, you could say, I'm a traditional hypnotist. Now, if you wake up tomorrow morning and you say, it's a beautiful day in wherever you are, I think I'll be an Ericksonian therapist then these are the substates that you would assume. And if you assumed one or two or six of those substates, you could say, I'm an Ericksonian therapist. So therapist doesn't exist. 
Therapist is just a construct of convenience that we use for describing a certain social, psychological, physiological conglomeration of elements and you get to choose the elements that you want that will create therapist according to the dictates of your philosophy. There's no right way to be a therapist. Nobody has come up with it. And we, we couldn't agree scientifically on what is the right way of being a therapist. So this phenomenological view is cheerful to me because it gives you four choices. One is that you can disturb some of the elements that create the problem, be it depression, anxiety, or bad habit, or bad relationship. You can elicit some of the components that um, would be the opposite. Every depressed person has been external and has been present, has been active. And so it's a matter more of waking up things that already exist than it is teaching the person things that they don't know. Or you could use hypnosis as a bridge between the land of the problem and the land of the solution. As if the problem, if you think about a car, the car is in reverse, you want the car to be in first gear. In order to go from reverse in a standard shift car, you have to go through neutral in order to get into first gear. So hypnosis could be like neutral, demonstrating to a person, you can change your state. If you can change your state once, you can change it again. But another route, fourth route, is therapist. And uh, the land of the problem to the land of the solution can be bridged by therapist. And if you spent an hour with Viktor Frankl, Virginia Satir, Salvador Mnuchin, Milton Erickson, Carl Whitaker, you would be a different person and each of them would be in an, a socially empowering state, each one of them being different, but each one of them would be a socially empowering state, you would be different by virtue of spending time with them. And uh, their conclusions about what is essential in therapy from a philosophical and scientific perspective would be radically different. But therapist and depending on how you assume substates would be different. So then, um, how do we develop therapist states? And this is the book that I'm currently finishing which I fondly call psychoaerobics. Okay, so these are exercises and this is a, an example of, a, of an exercise and with the little bit of time that we have left, I'd like to demonstrate some of these things, but I want to talk about the underlying thinking. The underlying thinking is a little bit like playing the piano Right? You play scales. It doesn't matter how good a concert pianist is, you still practice scales. You practice, if, if you're a concert violinist, you practice scales. You, you, you need to, to, to keep the requisite um, states, the requisite flexibility that you need in order to play that instrument. And this has to do with the way in which actors are trained. Actors are not trained scientifically. Actors are trained in a way that is experiential. And you have exercises, like warm-up exercises, and you have exercises that teach you to suddenly be in the state that you need to be in order to be an actor. So they mostly are trained by using uh, experiential exercises and uh, you learn improvisation and you learn how to do scene work by virtue of an, a, an experiential process, not by virtue of a didactic process. So I've been a little bit of a corporate raider and I think, well, if actors are trained experientially, then therapists can be trained experientially to enter states. Oh, where I'm failing you, admittedly, at this moment, 
is that having not given this lecture before, I um, was developing the theoretical background, which leaves us less time for the experiential part, but so be it. So maybe 20 years ago, maybe more, I got the idea that therapists are more like actors than they are like scientists, and they should be trained more like actors. So I called my sister, who is an acting person, a theater person, and I said, Sandy, how do people learn to be actors? And she glibly said, uh, take a course. So I signed up for a course, and it was led by a woman who was a PhD in theater. And the course is... Uh, basically 10, 18-year-olds and me. <laughs> and these people really want to do acting. And so we're going around the room to introduce ourselves in the first minutes of the class. I'm Jane, I'm here because I want to do theater. I'm John, I'm here because I want to do commercials. I'm June, I'm here because I want to do television. I'm Jeff, and I'm here as a spy. I want to learn how you teach people to be actors. And then we stood up in a circle for a warm-up exercise that the teacher called Lala's. Okay. So the teacher starts, we're all in a circle, and the teacher's going, la 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 And we're all supposed to do the same thing that the teacher's doing. So we're all doing Lala's. I am signed up for an acting course. What are we doing, Lala's? Okay. And then the teacher steps out of the group and she says, okay, Jeff, now you use the same rhythm but choose a different consonant and a different gesture. Everybody will mirror you. I'm a psychologist, so I'm doing pa-pa-pa-pa-pa-pa, pa-pa-pa-pa-pa-pa-pa, and everybody's doing papas. And then the next person is doing gaga. Gaga-ga-ga-ga-ga-ga, gaga-ga-ga-ga-ga-ga. And the teacher's saying to me, no, no, Jeff, not gaga. Gaga, listen. And the teacher saying, no, Jeff, not. Watch the leader. And then suddenly we finish and we're doing a new warm-up exercise. Uh, 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 wait. She says, what? I said, well, uh, uh, aren't we going to share? Or are we going to talk about our experience? <laughs> <laughs> she says, no, next exercise. And suddenly I have that same kind of woozy feeling that I had when I was with Milton Erickson and he's just giving me experiences. And uh, I have to suddenly shift into a different gear. And I'm thinking, okay, well, what are we learning? Well, one of the things we're learning is articulation, not gaga, gaga. And one of the things that we're learning is big gestures. And one of the things that we're learning is accurate mirroring, accurate modeling. Okay, now I've got categories for these things. But it's not cognitive. It's not like the teacher is saying, the first lesson that you need to know when you're doing acting is articulation. The next lesson is you need big gestures if you're going to be on stage. And the next thing you need to know is to do modeling because if you're going to be a waiter or a street person or a captain of industry, you need to watch those people and you need to know how do they act so that you can replicate that in your role. No, it's completely experiential with the implicit understanding that once we got on stage, we would be using big gestures, we would be using articulation, we would be mirroring, modeling. It would just seamlessly happen because we had developed those substates. So this is what I've been trying to do by virtue of developing this program that I fondly called psychoaerobics, which is aerobic exercises for being the best therapist. So let me uh, pick one of the more interesting ones to demonstrate. And fortunately, we have somebody who is willing to volunteer. And uh, we'll do exercise 45A. And somehow I'll figure out a way of making these available. And if we can get past that, we'll try to do something else. 
Okay, so now to do this, what we're going to do is ask for a volunteer, somebody who will role play a problem. Mm -hmm. So you're going to role play a problem, uh, role play a problem. and the role play a simple problem of like depression or anxiety or role play a problem of a bad habit. Just choose a, a problem out of the hat. Okay, do I say it or do I just... Yes, okay, so now we're, we are entering my therapy office. Okay. Right, now the strange part of this exercise, because it's about therapist development, is this is not about you. Okay. You're off the hook. So everything is going to be focusing on me and what states I enter in and I'm restricting myself, so I'll use minimal words. And then what I'm going to do is to force myself to use gestures to try to reflect an empathic understanding. Okay. Now you stay with words. Huh? I stay with gestures. Right. Uh-huh. And uh, so can we begin? Sure. Okay, your name is? I'm Sylvia. Sylvia, okay, thank you for helping and cooperating. Okay, so Sylvia, what, you're coming in to me, and what is it that you want to accomplish? Um, I'm unable to drive. Mm -hmm. um, I used to drive, and now um, it's been about maybe four or five years that mm -hmm. I cannot drive. So being unable, is it like this? Is it like this? No. I drive, but I get anxiety, mm -hmm. I think. So you get into the car, and suddenly you feel like this, you feel like this, yeah. you feel like this. Yeah, I do. And like I this? Feel pain. I feel pain. Uh-huh. So it's, oh. Yeah. Uh-huh. So you're here, I'm there, and I'm suddenly this, which could become this, and then yes. this. Right. Uh-huh. Sweaty palms. Uh-huh. So it's like... Heart rate beating. Mm-hmm. So suddenly... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So as I understand right now, you get into the car, suddenly you're here, and then this starts, which could develop to this, which could develop to this, which could develop to this, and suddenly... And the palms. I uh -huh. feel sweaty. Yep. And... Yeah. Yep. Uh-huh. And then what happens? Well, I become frightened, so mm -hmm. I park. So I, I imagine even before that, like... Yeah. Yeah, I go into a little panic. Mm -hmm. I pull to the side, mm -hmm. and then my panic worsens as I see vehicles passing me, and I stay numb for a good while. Mm -hmm. So after that, it's like... Well, no, I'm still hyperventilating. Uh -huh, you're still going... <laughs> yeah, and you're I'm going still, <laughs> wow, you know, mm -hmm. when is this going to go away? Uh-huh, so it's, uh-huh. So it's a and horrible then, experience. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> it really is. And what is it that you really want to do? Well, despite of feeling this session, I still drive because I have to go to work, I have to pick up my kids. So right now it's been like you have... But uh, I still do it, however, I'm unable to drive on the freeway. I can drive on the streets because I force myself. I know I'm going to get that, but I got to pick up my kids. Mm -hmm. However, I've curtailed my going out, my visiting friends, because I'm unable to drive on the freeway. So instead of being able to drive like this, You've been driving like this, yeah. and like this, and like this. Yeah. What, what you really want to be able to do is to be able to... Yes. And you, what you really want to be able to do is to... Yeah. Uh-huh. And what you really want to be able to do is to be able to... Yes. <sighs> yeah. Uh-huh. Because right now I'm anxious and I'm angry. Why is it happening to me? Mm -hmm. So, um, as i beginning to understand even more, so it's like you start to get into the car, right? Then this, then this, then this, then this, then this, then this, then... 
Oh, and that, then, no, and I forgot another symptom. I when I'm driving, I feel like I'm gonna lose my balance, mm -hmm. so I have to hang on to the vehicle. Mm -hmm. So that's something odd. And I, I hang on to the steering wheel with one hand, and with the other, I'm I'm, I'm touching something because I think that it's gonna make me fall or I'm gonna lose my balance. Mm -hmm. So that's something else. Right, like there's an overall sense that being in a car at this moment can't be yeah mm -hmm. and that being in a car is somehow yeah uh-huh and what you'd really like to be is to now tell me a situation in which you are that has nothing to do with cars well when i'm working when I'm so when you're at work, yeah. it's like... Yeah, I'm relaxed, I'm happy, I'm doing what I normally do. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a sense when you're at work that you're normal, that you're... Yeah, that I'm content. Uh -huh. And what you want to do is to have that sense. And you really don't know at this moment how to be able to get there. Uh -huh. right. And what I understand is this has been going on for a while. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's stop because we're just, we're not trying to cure you, we're <laughs> trying to cure me. <laughs> okay. Right? So we're trying to help me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what, what do I do? Right? What is it like for me? What is something that is representative of my phenomenological experience? So when I am doing this role play for you, I'm in a state that I would call Juliet is the sun. Okay. Now, Juliet is the sun is a metaphor. This is that. Juliet is the sun. Mm -hmm. So suddenly what I'm doing is whatever you're telling me, I'm transforming that into a metaphor and I'm using my hands as a gesture. Right. And what I'm doing is I am practicing being in this Juliet is the sun state, this is that. And what I'm doing is that I'm paying homage to Carl Rogers, who I met a couple of times and uh, appreciate his genius and his contribution, and that was being empathic. And what I'm doing in, in this exercise is I'm being experientially empathic. So what I'm doing is to create visual empathy, not just an empathy that is a reflective verbal empathy, but a visual empathy, three-dimensional empathy, experiential empathy. Now, to get into that state of Juliet is the sun, this is that, to get into this state of experiential empathy, I have to do something that transforms me. Okay. And what I do to transform me, let's see if I can find something that expresses that. Okay, so to get into that state, I think that the primary characteristic is that I am really focused. So for that moment that I was in this Juliet is the sun state, this is that, and for that moment that I was in this experiential state is that basically I had shut off my left hemisphere and I was just focused on you. And whatever it was that you communicated to me, I was going to do this, I would do this, and basically they would be a byproduct of me being singularly focused on you. And that focus was that I was seeing details that I hadn't seen before. Okay, now let me think about that one more step. So when my patient comes into my office and I want to access 
that state, then what I'm going to do is that as soon as the patient comes in, I'm going to focus attentively and I'm going to start noticing details that haven't, hap that haven't happened before. And by virtue of doing that, I'm going to create these two states and suddenly my empathy will be experiential and suddenly I will be in that Juliet is, is the sun state. Great. Okay. okay. Thank you. So, no, thank you. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> okay. I want to leave some time for questions, but I want to, to move into another area and we'll work with you okay. in this other area. Okay. So your name is? Damien. Damien. Okay. So Damien, come, come here and um, stand here. Okay, so now you are practicing therapy, you're learning therapy. I'm learning therapy. Okay, but you've seen some... I, I, I've been in uh, individual group, I've been in family therapy, marriage therapy, sex therapy, I've been in addiction, thera addiction therapy, I've had... <laughs> Thank you. Youth delinquency therapy, mm -hmm. I've had pretty much quite a few different therapies, and quite a few different therapy styles. Okay, great. And some okay, are more effective. But you want to be... A therapist. Correct. Okay, this is something that's really important to you. Yes. Something that you want in your life. Yeah. Okay. So what I want you to do for a moment is think about all of the therapies that you've experienced, all of the therapies that you've read about, and for a moment what I'd like you to do is to transform yourself and allow yourself and allow your body to represent as a therapist at your best, who will you be? So just sculpt yourself into a representation of who you can be at your best as a clinician. I'll take that. Okay, so you want me to express how I would feel. Uh huh. And how I would feel is I really want to Okay, wait, focus nope, no words. Just allow your body to, uh, so we're gonna take away the words from you. And what you want to do is to just be an artist. And so if I said, you know, Damien, sculpt yourself into a representation. Oh, thank you. So sculpt yourself into a representation of being uh, frustrated. So frustrated. If I said, wait, okay, really wait. Words. okay. Yeah. If I said, okay, <laughs> sculpt yourself into a representation of being happy. Right? Excellent. So now, allow yourself to meditate on being your best as a therapist, which could be two years or three months or five years into the future. Scope, allow your body to take on a representation of who you are, at, uh, who you could imagine yourself to be at your best as a therapist. Great. Okay, hold that for a moment, right? Close your eyes for a moment. Allow yourself to get the felt sense of that posture so that you can close your eyes, so that you can feel the rhythm of your breathing, so that you can sense the gentle pressure of your right hand, so that you can feel the comfort of your left hand and Notice the orientation of your head and get the realization that this represents who it is that you can be at your best as a clinician. And then hold it for a moment. Okay, and then you can open your eyes. Uh-huh. Great. And how is that? Does that feel satisfactory to you? Yeah, it feels connecting and, connecting and, and empathetic. And empathic <coughs> and empathetic. Great. Okay, so stay with it for a moment, right? And now let's see if there's something small that we can do that will increase the sense of being empathetic and being the best therapist who you can be. And here's what I'd like you to, to do, small. I'd like you to move your right foot just a couple of inches forward. 
okay? Now take the same moment, close your eyes, get the sense of what that's like, of moving your foot forward just a little bit, changing the balance, changing your orientation in space in relationship to me. And then there's a little smile that begins to happen and then you can get the felt sense of what that's like. This is you being your best. Okay, then open your eyes. How did that modification <coughs> work as far as helping to your experience? Well, you said about becoming closer to you, and so the act of me um, pushing myself towards you is the act of me being more empathetic in, in your you know, right. realm of environment. Right. right, so now you've moved over to the understanding part and I'd like you to stay over on the experiential part. Did that modification increase your sense of being the best Damien as a therapist? Somewhat. Somewhat, okay. So then take, take another moment, move your foot back like half an inch or a little half midway. Yeah, great, okay. Go back, close your eyes and feel the sense of that and play with your foot and feel where it is that you can place yourself that increases your experiential realization of being Damien the best that you can be as a clinician. And when you've got it, then just nod your head slightly to me so that I know that you're there. Tremendous. Keep playing with it until you feel the way in which your felt sense changes. And when you've got it, just got it, okay? Take a moment and then see what, realize what can accompany that. Like perhaps what can accompany that is a rhythm that perhaps what can accompany that is that it can seem as though time changes. Perhaps what can accompany that is a sense of listening carefully, carefully listening to the tone and the tempo of my voice. And perhaps what can accompany that is a solid sense of being present. And when you recognize that accompaniment, then with your eyes closed, I would invite you to just look up to the top of your head, take an easy breath. And as you exhale fully, memorize that posture. as if you're allowing your body to memorize that posture, as if you're allowing your body to memorize the accompaniment. Just like as a boy you may have memorized riding a bicycle, this is something that you don't remember in your mind. This is something that you realize in your body. And as you do that, you could envision yourself two years, five years, three months from now, 
providing empathic counseling, attentive counseling, providing an excellent experiential moment. You could envision yourself in your therapist's chair and suddenly the realization of this felt sense can permeate your experience. And you could envision that experience, even envision that experience at work, inside you and memorize that experience so that it's at home inside you and remember that experience in relationship to the capacity of your unconscious mind, your inner mind to guide you. And when you begin to know that you can do that, then once again you can take one or two or three easy breaths, just take one or two or three easy breaths and open your eyes and bring yourself back here fully alert. I Pleasant? Yeah. Got it? Yeah. Uh-huh. It's with you. Yes. Great. Okay, now stop. You can relax. Great. Okay, now, so now, what, what am I doing, right? What is it that, what's the state that I'm in? Okay, great for Damien, and if he can get something out of what I'm doing, so much the better. But the state that I'm in is being contentless. I don't know what the content is. And sometimes I could be working with a problem, somebody's trauma, and I don't have to ask what are the details about the trauma. I don't have to know the content. I can know that a person is in a state of being socially withdrawn, is being a state of having uh, intrusions in their mind, having a state of being hypersensitive, and that these are the normal sequela of trauma, being exposed to an abnormal event, and I can be working with a person without knowing the content. Okay, so what happened to me? So I shifted into a state of being symbolic. And I shifted into a state of being poetic. And I didn't need my language to be logical and clear and concrete. And my language could be amorphous and poetic. And it was like I felt myself shifting into this state of being poetic and using the poetry of my words to see if I could augment any part of Damien's experience. And that I was in the state of being symbolic and that I didn't need to know content and that I was um, working with purely symbolic representations. Okay, so how do I know that I did that? Well, I think that I know that I did that because I speed it up a little bit. And uh, I speed it up a little bit so I wasn't thinking so much, so I wasn't analyzing things so much, so that I could just stay in that moment of being poetic and being symbolic in my, in my speech. So those were things that I was developing inside myself. Okay, so you could sit and thank you so much. We thank Damien for, yeah. Okay, now that is not the way in which I learned to be a therapist. And that was not the kind of training that I had. And if I had a student like Damien, and I'm supervising him, and I'm asking him to stand up, and I'm asking him to do these different things, and to memorize postures, and to make a small change, to feel that there can be a systemic reorientation by virtue of making a small change, and that you can really feel something, that a small change can lead to a larger systemic reorientation. I'm not saying, okay, Damien, now understand that a small change can have a systemic effect. I'm over here and I'm just giving you the experience that a small change can have a really large felt sense. All right, now, I apologize for failing you for a little bit because I had many more little exercises like this that I hoped to uh, 
to demonstrate, but we don't have time to do that. But Tom may have some pressing question that has come from the Ethernet that <laughs> I could I take. I do. We have uh, many, many questions from the, uh, from the virtual audience. I'll start off with this one because it, it came from at least, uh, at least eight or nine um, attendees asked the same question. How does the concept of states relate to Gestalt therapy, and, and what are the uh, important points of distinction in your opinion? Right. Yeah, I, I have a significant training in my history for Gestalt therapy. I trained with, um, uh, with Joan Fagan and Irma Shepard, who were two of Pearl's students, and I also trained with uh, and spent some time with Irv Polster. So Gestalt is important to me, and Gestalt enters into my way of approaching problems, but not so um, in, in Gestalt, you may be dealing with a top dog and an underdog. You may, have a par you may be working in a parts orientation. Gestalt is an essentially experiential therapy, but things like EMDR are experiential. There's aspects of NLP that are experiential. So uh, psychodrama can be experiential. So there's going to be decided similarities between any therapy that is experiential. But I really wasn't thinking about gestalt. I wasn't thinking about projections. I wasn't thinking about parts. I was thinking experientially, being experiential. So it wasn't like I had a theory of transactional analysis or psychodynamic or gestalt that was in my mind when I was doing this. Great, and I'll turn to the uh, in-person audience here in just a, just a moment. Uh, I, I thought this was an interesting question. In your opinion, is the ex uh, experiential process appropriate for those suffering from PTSD, or uh, might it be problematically uncomfortable or run the risk of re-traumatizing them? No, it would be my sense that this would be a necessity, that experiential methods would be a necessity of working with PTSD. And if you looked into the work of you know, experts like Bessel van der Kock, it, it, working with PTSD is a bottom-up approach, it's not a top-down approach. Working with PTSD cognitively is a slow route. You want to work from the bottom up, and you want to help people to get the felt sense of how they can be different. So I think, to me, PTSD requires an experiential orientation if you want to help the person uh, more quickly. Now, cognitive processing, understanding how you're going to create meaning out of the trauma, that may be part of working with uh, PTSD and could be one of the stages that you want to use in your treatment of PTSD. How can you use, how can you create resilience out of trauma? In your experience, what are some uh, ways that you've been able to utilize uh, hypnosis effectively with a uh, uh, somewhat resistant or, or skeptical client? Yes. Well, hypnosis teaches you to work with resistance in a way that you don't necessarily learn with other therapies. Here's the client. Here's the therapist. Well, the therapist is putting pressure on the client. Now, that pressure could be an interpretation, a clarification, or a confrontation, and that puts pressure on the client, and then you're going to get some counterforce because if the, if the client is totally cooperative, well, that's a form of resistance in itself. Well, hypnosis is a larger pressure that you're putting on someone. And so part of the art of learning how to do hypnosis is learning how to help people to surmount their resistances to be able to get into more adaptive states. So you could say that one of Erickson's contributions, some people have said that Erickson's primary contribution was his uh, work with resistances and how he developed so many techniques to help people to work with their resistances. So um, resistance is a byproduct of pressure and uh, you, you need to have resistance because that you're, you're working against the homeostatic mechanism in the person. The person is in a ho some, some homeostatic balance even with their problem. It has taken on a homeostatic valence. You're trying to put pressure to get the person to move forward and, uh, and resistance is going to be a byproduct. So how people resist is uh, part of the art of learning how to construct effective hypnosis.
Okay, just a couple more questions, and I'll turn to the audience here. Uh, it's kind of a related question to the to the previous one. Is it necessary? Is it helpful, or perhaps even necessary, for the client to be aware of their state in order to experience growth through? No, this? it's not necessarily. Um, it's not. It's not imperative that the client knows the exact nature of their state. In some general way, the client is going to know I'm withdrawn or I'm irresponsible or I'm procrastinating. But to know the actual details of that state may not be necessary for the client. It's just that the client knows that whatever he's doing right now, whatever she's doing right now, is not being functional, is not being adaptive, is not being generative. So. Uh, and sometimes the client doesn't even necessarily have the right um, uh, terminology for being able to adequately describe their state. And they're using the best terminology that they know to describe the complexity of their state. They have a category that they use. And we can't just go with the category that the client is using. We un need to understand what it means. If the client says, I'm withdrawn, what does that mean? If the client says, I'm depressed, what does that mean? Our clinical understandings do not necessarily match the subjective understanding of the client. We need to understand that the client is using the best terms that he or she knows to describe his or her state, but we need to be able to, to know uh, the meaning of that in order to really help the person to break out of that mold and move into something more effective. Uh, early no, I'm rushing a little bit because you gave me a five-minute sign, so oh. <laughs> uh, I, I, I... No, I think we're... Uh, we're okay? Yeah, I'm well, okay. We've, got, uh, we've probably got about five more minutes. Okay, great. Uh, early on in your presentation, you half-jokingly talked about clients who come in looking to change and those who come in uh, hoping to change all those around them, and a number of attendees kind of uh, 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 seized upon that. And mm -hmm. what would your response be to that, to that person? To, what would your approach be to working with a person who really is resistant to change, would rather change all those around? Right. Her? Well, we, um, you're, you're working with the person who's in the room. And um, some influence can be ex uh, um, created through implication. So sometimes if you say to a person, this is how you should be with your adolescent child, right? Well, you know, the direct route may not be the most effective in helping that person. So perhaps what I would do is And by that gesture, I mean that the amount of indirection is directly proportional to the perceived resistance. Now, wasn't it so much better that I expressed that in a gesture than in words, right? So if the concepts that I'm trying to communicate meet with resistance, then becoming more indirect, so maybe telling stories about influence, telling stories about children, or telling stories about animals and how they're influenced, and setting up an idea that can become a concept in the person's mind about how they can be different. Because if a parent is just complaining about the irresponsible behavior of an adolescent, the adolescent isn't in the room. And um, uh, if you're um, you know, instructing the parent on b the best practices for parenting techniques and it works, because you used information, great. But if you're using information and it doesn't work, then you would take a more experiential orientation. And that experiential orientation may be by using more implication than by using instruction and advice. Hi, I really enjoyed um, your presentation. Thank you. A few things that um, I, I wanted to address as you were talking was, when you talked about the adaptive um, and the non-adaptive, States. Uh, states, right. So uh, to me, some of those states could be, uh, and that you call adaptive, could also become maladaptive or not adaptive Absolutely. because you can be too attentive. You can, you can feel too conscientious where you're never taking care of yourself. Absolutely. You can be too praising where you, where you actually become a, a problem to your child where they don't live in reality. I mean, all the things you, you list, except moral. I don't think you can really be too moral. So. <laughs> 
But I mean, there's some of this like, like doubting. Sometimes you need to doubt things. Sometimes Absolutely. you do need to believe. So mm -hmm. I think universally, there, I, I just find a problem calling those distinctly yeah, only that's a very helpful. That's good. Uh, adaptive because I don't think that that they, that that many things can become maladaptive or counteradaptive. And then the other thing, it seems so that's like very helpful. That was helpful you. to me. So I, I, there's no, I don't have any comment on that other than I got it. Okay. And then the other thing that I, I want to address, it seems like you're doing somewhat of a psychodynamic um, element in the fact that you're trying to produce in the other person, which also goes, and I know, to the um, to doing the hypnotherapy. It's, it's altering the state of the other person, but that happens in psychodynamic all the time, to me, the whole process. And the other thing I want to say is it seems like you're trying to, to initiate, which could be beneficial or negative, into the counselor, a, a counter-transference of the client into the counselor, and then a counter-transference back to the client to receive. So I think it's beneficial, but I think it could be, it just feels like it could be that, that taking on too much. Like in other words, if someone comes in like you're doing the, the effect, what if they come in, they've been raped and tortured, and I start taking that on and then pushing it through me back onto them. I, I can just see that it, it could be an issue depending on the, the, you know, the psychological state of the client and the events the experiential that they've gone through. Because I know that once you start doing events that you're doing with gestures, you're creating a psychodynamic in the person to re-experience possibly what they went through. And so I wanted yeah. to see how did, well, uh, one other thing, sorry. The other thing I wanted to say is also phenomenology is a, is a, is a philosophy. It's a philosophy of understanding the what is going on so I, I and it and it is turning into actually here in uh, Southern California into a science. Mm -hmm. So, anyways. Okay. Well, those are some excellent comments. So, good therapy is is going to be good therapy, and the, you know whether you're working with cognitive behavior therapy, behavior therapy, humanistic therapy, family therapy, there's going to be a change in the psychodynamic if you're being effective, right? right? So that the, you want some aspect of the psychodynamic to change. And uh, so that will happen in any good therapy, even straight behavior therapy, where you are doing a complete you know, systemic, systematic desensitization. Um, and uh, then, because there were four points of, of what you made, and I could get the second one, but I suddenly slipped on the third one, the um, counter-transference issue, right? So, you know, counter-transference is defined um, in, in a psychodynamic uh, a way as anything that the therapist would do that would disturb the transference in a non-constructive way of the patient, right? So the therapist is uh, projecting his um, conflicts, his templates from the past onto the patient, and that was ipso facto bad. Now, it, it just doesn't have the same relevance to me. Well, yeah, well, I wasn't saying that it's always bad. I was just saying that it, it has the potential. It has the potential to, to affect negatively in the, the counselor and negatively. Not that it, it has to be. It certainly can actually be, be both. I, I wasn't saying that well, it's... Well, I, no, I, I, I... I don't agree with the analytical that, that it's right. totally bad. That in analytical be, thinking, it's totally bad. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. disagree. But I was yeah. just saying I, I think it's... But you, so, yes, you, you risk... Um, projecting some things that could be potentially disturbing to the client right. and uh, that requires a degree of sensitivity that you would have to understand and uh, be able to utilize whatever the reaction was that happened. You, you, in my form of therapy, you take more risks. 